By the way, this isn't all of the stuff. I'm just hitting the highlights. I mean, my parents, because of all the why questions I would ask, finally went out and said, here, and they bought me an encyclopedia and said, look, the answers are in there. Go look for them. Go find them yourself. I mean, that's just the way I was. And so I guess it's natural that I would become a journalist because journalists are looking for facts. They're looking for evidence. They're looking for data. They're looking for something that they can publish in the paper and have confidence it is true. Lee Strobel earned a Master of Studies in Law degree from Yale Law School and is the former legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He is the best-selling author of several books that explore the evidence for the Christian faith. And so I decided to use my legal training and journalism training, my scientific curiosity, to systematically investigate, is there any credibility to the Christian faith? Two-time Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling once said that science should be the search for truth. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't know where the evidence was ultimately going to take me, but I really did want to know the truth about God. And what I found shocked me, and it stunned me. Premise one is that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Something cannot come into being uncaused out of absolutely nothing. Premise two is that the universe began to exist. And the remarkable development that has occurred is that for the first time, we now have solid scientific evidence for the truth of that second premise that the universe began to exist. And from those two premises, it follows logically, therefore, the universe has a cause of its existence. Whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. And that points to a reality beyond the universe, a transcendent reality beyond space and time, and therefore non-physical and immaterial, which created the universe out of nothing and brought it into being. Since the beginning of time, all the matter in the universe has been governed by precisely balanced laws and constants. During an interview with Robin Collins, a philosopher with degrees in mathematics and physics, Strobel learned how these laws offer compelling evidence for a creator and conspire to make the universe habitable for life. The laws of physics are balanced on a razor's edge for life to occur. For example, if you didn't have something like gravity that pulled matter together, you would never get planets, you wouldn't get stars, you wouldn't get any complex organisms. If you didn't have the strong nuclear force, there would be nothing to hold protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. And so you wouldn't have any atoms, so no chemistry. If you didn't have the electromagnetic force, you would have no bonding between chemicals. You would have no light, and the list goes on. So you need all these sorts of fundamental principles have to be in place in order for life to occur. Wipe out one of those principles, wipe out one of those laws, no life. Strobel learned that life also hinges on the precise strengths and relative values of many different physical constants. One example of this fine-tuning is the force of gravity. Imagine a ruler divided up into one-inch increments and then stretched across the entire universe, a distance of some 14 billion light years. For the purposes of illustration, the ruler represents the possible range for gravity. In other words, the setting for the strength of gravity could have been anywhere along the ruler, but it just happens to be situated in exactly the right place so that life is possible. Now, if you were to change the force of gravity by moving the setting just one inch compared to the entire width of the universe, the effect on life would be catastrophic. No large-scale life forms could exist. Anything that was more than the size of a pea would be completely crushed. So you might be able to get life of a very, very primitive sort, such as bacteria, but you could never get conscious observers. The strength of gravity is just one of at least 30 separate parameters that must be finely tuned to produce a life-sustaining universe. Another example is the cosmological constant. 
The cosmological constant describes the expansion speed of space in the universe. If space expands too quickly, then the universe will spread out so quickly that material objects can't form. So you can't get stars and galaxies and planets and the types of things that we, of course, take for granted in our universe. Physicists have determined that the cosmological constant is fine-tuned to one part in a hundred million, billion, 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 billion. Such precision has been compared to traveling hundreds of miles into space, then throwing a dart at the Earth and hitting a bullseye measuring one trillionth of a trillionth of an inch in diameter, an area less than the width of a single atom. Just consider those two parameters, gravity and the cosmological constant. Their level of fine-tuning is to a precision of one part in a hundred million trillion, 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 trillion. I mean, that's like one atom in the entire known universe. This fine-tuning is also evident at the atomic level. The strong nuclear force binds atoms together. If the strength of this force were to decrease by one part in 10,000 billion, 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 the only element left in the universe would be hydrogen. Again, chemical life would not be possible. The fine-tuning of the laws and forces of physics is so precise that few theorists are comfortable invoking mere chance as an explanation. Unless our universe is not the only roll of the dice, if the universe looks like it's fine-tuned for complex life, maybe there's a fine-tuner. Maybe it was fine-tuned for life. And this has certain unsavory theological implications. And so it's not surprising that those committed to a, a fundamentally materialistic view of reality uh, would try to find an escape hatch. And the most popular escape hatch for this theological implication of fine-tuning is this idea of multiple universes. As its name suggests, the theory of multiple universes proposes that our universe is not alone. Instead, it is part of a vast ensemble of universes, each with a different set of laws and constants. If there's only one universe, then the conclusion that the universe looks fine-tuned because it is fine-tuned is inescapable. But if our universe is just one of a vast set, then you seem to have more resources to play with. Chance gets a new lease on life. I sometimes try to imagine what physicists have in mind that postulate this idea of multiple universes. I mean, what would the generator look like that creates them? Maybe it's like a giant monolith that has dozens of different dials, each of which has to be set to the right physical constant. If we think of these parameters as dials, each of the dials is different. So if you produce enough universes with enough different dial settings, eventually, just by chance, you get one just right. So you might have to produce a trillion, 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 trillion universes. But eventually, if you have a generator that's just spitting out just an enormous number of them, then it gets the right dial setting. And then, by just chance, you get conditions right for life. So it's a huge cosmic lottery. That's the idea. It's an interesting idea. I mean, there's really only one problem with it. There's no independent evidence that it's true. Besides, it really just pushes the question back a step because we could still ask who built the generator. The suggestion of multiple universes strikes me as a desperate attempt to explain away the obvious, which is that the universe is finely tuned by an intelligence to sustain complex life an intelligence that must be beyond the constraints of time and space. Strobel's journey through a universe finely tuned for life inevitably led him home to the blue jewel of our solar system, the planet Earth. There he encountered another array of critically balanced conditions essential to human existence. When I was an atheist, I saw planet Earth as being one of probably billions of planets just like it all over the universe. I saw our sun as being an average, undistinguished type of a sun. I figured as I looked up at the stars at night that there must be millions and millions of advanced civilizations out there. I just thought there was an ordinariness to our situation. 
This line of reasoning was totally consistent with my atheistic worldview. But what I learned later is that it's not consistent with what science is revealing about the Earth. Strobel's investigation caused him to consider the many conditions necessary for a life-sustaining planet. In the process, he was introduced to the science of astrobiology and astronomer Guillermo Gonzalez. I'm an astrobiologist, and what motivates me is just to examine the conditions necessary for life and look elsewhere in the universe and see if those conditions are met anywhere else. And the answer could be yes, and the answer could be no, and either answer is interesting. For more than a decade, Guillermo Gonzalez has researched the characteristics of a planet required to support complex life. Estimates vary, but a current list of these factors would number at least 20 and include an oxygen-rich atmosphere, liquid water and large continental land masses, a home star of the right temperature and mass, an orbital path that is neither too far nor too close to the home star, a moon large enough to stabilize the tilt of the planet's axis and the movement of its tides, a magnetic field strong enough to deflect the sun's radiation, and a position in the relatively narrow habitable region of a spiral galaxy. All these factors have to be met at one place and time in the galaxy if you're going to have a planet as habitable as the Earth, which you need for complex and even technological life. Theorists have attempted to calculate the odds of all the necessary factors for life appearing at the same time on the same planet. A conservative estimate is one chance in 10 to the negative 15th, or one one thousandth of one one trillionth. On those terms, even when compared to the billions of suns and possible planets in our Milky Way galaxy, the probability of even a single habitable world appears unlikely. There are many probabilistic resources in the galaxy, but on the other side of the coin are all these factors that you need. You have to get just right in order to have just one habitable planet like the Earth. And that leads me to conclude that, yes, we're rare in the galaxy. There are many examples of this correlation, including our planet's oxygen-rich atmosphere, both a critical requirement for our survival and a transparent window that allows us to explore the distant universe. The Earth's precise distance from the Sun and the size of its moon and home star. These factors not only control our planet's temperature, axial tilt, and the movement of its tides, they also ensure perfect solar eclipses, phenomena that have provided scientists with invaluable data about the composition of stars and the properties of light. And our location in the Milky Way. The Earth is positioned between two spiral arms within a relatively small region where life is possible. As a result, we enjoy an excellent platform for clear, unimpeded views of our galaxy and the rest of the cosmos. I think God intentionally created a habitat for us that allows us to see him through the creation that he has left behind. And this habitat is conducive for us to do scientific research. It didn't have to be that way, but it is. Why? Because I believe that by doing science, we find God. The final leg of Strobel's investigation transported him from the deepest reaches of the cosmos to the microscopic universe of the living cell and the science of biochemistry. There he encountered more challenges to Darwinian evolution and new evidence of design. If simple water molecules that form ice crystals exhibit magnificent structure, 
Consider the design ingenuity behind large, complex molecules, such as DNA. DNA contains the blueprint for all life and is by far the densest information storage mechanism known in the universe. For example, the amount of information contained in a pinhead volume of DNA would fill a stack of books 500 times higher than from here to the moon. The program code and design of such an incredible system indicates a supremely intelligent designer. The evidence to me that just cries out that there's a God is the study of DNA. DNA is a very powerful, massive information storage system. In fact, DNA that makes up our genes actually is like books of information that's read by a language system. It's absolutely phenomenal. And scientists know today that language as a code only come from an intelligence, and information only comes from information. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to a code. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to information. And as you look at DNA, it actually cries out. In the beginning, God created the universe. We all begin as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence. How does that cell know how to build a, a body with 100 trillion uh, cells in it, thousands of different kinds, and each one of them is so complex, nanochemical machinery beyond our comprehension how it works, and encoded is the instruction manual. It's the manufacturer's manual how to build and operate every part of this incredible body made up of a hundred trillion cells. Furthermore, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule that is self-replicating. Each molecule is able to make an identical copy quickly and efficiently. The Lord has even programmed DNA to detect and correct replication errors. These sophisticated capabilities far exceed man's means. God has created the DNA molecule in such a way that it is self-correcting. There are special proteins called enzymes that go up and down the DNA molecule looking for and making repairs on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. God created us with a DNA code that actually has what we call editase or editorial type enzymes. Just as an editor reads a newspaper or a book looking for mistakes, so God has created special enzymes that go up and down our DNA molecule repairing the mistakes in ways that are unbelievably complex. There are many examples in creation of, of things that demonstrate the biblical God. Uh, one would be in our very DNA. Our DNA has information in it. And there is a whole field of scientific study called information science, which studies how information originates, how it's transmitted, and so on. And one of the laws of information science says that information never originates by itself in matter, never spontaneously comes about. Any time we trace uh, the copying of information back to its source, it always, it always comes back to a mind. And since we have creative information in DNA, that tells me that DNA comes from intelligence. It's not something that could possibly come about through millions of years of mutations and natural selection. That just won't work. Yet even the DNA molecule is simple compared to cells. All life consists of cells, and each cell functions as a miniature city. When we consider that a human body consists of trillions of cells working together as one unit, we should be in humble awe of our Creator's intimate care and perfect wisdom. Folks, I don't know about you, but I'd say based on the evidence, what I find absolutely amazing is I would say, maybe it's just me, but the evolutionists are being just a little bit biased with the information here. How about you? And not only that, folks, I would say with all confidence, they are being downright belligerent as well. And you and I, the Christians, are the one with the closed mind? I don't think so. I mean, gee whiz, folks, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say it appears to me somebody really is trying to hide the truth about God's existence through his creation or something. You know what I'm saying? But get this, folks, that's exactly what God said they would do nearly 2,000 years ago. God predicted this. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, God said, folks, this is coming down the pike. And specifically, we're going to see he's not very pleased with it. 
Might want to turn around, folks. This is what he said, Romans chapter 1. Now, I know you guys are intelligent. We're starting intelligent design, but the book of Romans was written too. Romans, you guys are on the ball. Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verses 18 through 23. That's right, folks. And notice the context of the passage is not God's love for mankind. He does love people. He loved them so much as we're going to celebrate next week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He sent his son to die on the cross. But God is right here. Is It's his wrath is being poured out on mankind. That's the context. But the issue is, why is God going to pour out his wrath on mankind? What's the cause of it? That's what we're going to see in our text here. Verse 18 says this, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who what? Suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. How? For since the what? Creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. You're not going to stand before God. I didn't know there was a God. You should be able to walk out your door, look at a tree, to a flea, to a bee, and go, oh my goodness, there's a God. Okay? That's why he says you're without excuse. He's given us evidence. He says, but here's the problem. For although they knew God, they knew better. They know that. They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their foolish thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became what? Fools. Why? Because you had the audacity to exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. We didn't come from gods. We came from what? The birds, the animals, and the reptiles. There are new gods as we can see. Now, folks, according to our text, I only find it interesting. Have you stopped to think about it? How the Bible not only predicted the behavior of the evolutionists that we see today, but as we saw in the text that those who are actually doing this, suppressing the truth about God's creation, His existence, what are they actually doing when they do that? The Bible says that those who suppress this truth are actually storing up the wrath of God. And how many guys would say that's probably not a very good thing to do? I mean, if you're going to get a hobby on Saturday afternoon, don't do that one, right? Okay, so here's the point. In order to help these people out, from stop storing up God's wrath and instead receive His grace through Jesus Christ. I think we better beef up our witness a little bit. How about you? In fact, let's say that. Say beef up your witness. Just say beef. That sounds better. Yeah, hey, right on. You guys know that. Okay, so in order to help these people out to become the most effective witnesses we can for Jesus Christ, we're going to begin a new series, that's right, called The Witness of Creation. It's going to be fun, folks. And what we're going to do is look at the five different evidence of God's creation that He has left behind for us. Here's the point, not just to know that God is real, Oh, it's this, people, that we really can have a personal, intimate relationship with the creator of the universe. And folks, it's pretty simple. The first evidence that God's left behind for you and I is the evidence of an intelligent creation. It wasn't by chance. Are you kidding? God is the one who ordered this whole thing into existence. And what we're going to do, folks, is we're not just going to take a look at the scriptural evidence. I mean, that should be good enough. But we're going to take a look at the scientific evidence showing us that, folks, we not only were, but we had to be. Use your own brain. We had to be intelligently designed by an intelligent creator. Praise God for an intelligent purpose. Isn't that a great message? I mean, think about the alternative. You, you are nothing. You came from nothing. When you die, you have no future. You're going back to be worm bait. If you teach kids that come from animals, why are we shocked when they act like them? If society believes there is no God, why are we shocked when they act godless? It's what you believe determines how you behave. And if you don't believe there's a God, you're going to act like it. Let's take a look at the logic of Mount Rushmore. Let's apply some questions to the formation of the world's largest rock group. That's right, Mount Rushmore. Okay, And ask these people these common logical questions about that simple formation. Do you believe evolutionists? that there is any way that these faces of Washington, Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Lincoln could have appeared on this rock by chance? Okay, do you think that the wind did that? Maybe erosion did it. Do you think, how about exfoliation? How about the uh, thermal expansion of rock, okay? Is that what created those faces? If you asked them what caused the faces to appear on Mount Rushmore, they would obviously say they were what? They're designed by somebody, and of course they're right, it was by an artist named Gutzon Borglum, okay? He had a rough time in kindergarten. Can you imagine with that name? Of? Wow, but anyway, but... <laughs> Chrome theory. Anyway, but then ask him this question, okay? So I'm thinking about it. Do you believe the men represented here happened by chance? If they believe in evolution, they gotta say yes, right? But then you ask him, no, wait a second. You don't think that their face could appear on rock by chance. 
But you think their whole complex anatomy with 50 trillion cells could happen by chance? Who's checking in who's breaking the door? But then ask him, well, how many years would it take for those faces to appear on the side of the mountain purely by chance? How about a million years? I'll give you a billion years. How about a hundred trillion years could these figures eventually form on the side of that mountain purely by chance, the faces? Well, of course, they would say it's impossible no matter how much time you give it, right? That's the logical response. But then ask him, isn't that though how you say we got here? After billions of years of chance and we're even more incredibly complex than just the faces on a rock, Mount Rushmore? Folks, the logical conclusion is that just as the faces on Mount Rushmore had to be designed, how much more then should the human body be designed? Okay? Who's checking in? Who's breaking the door? And speaking of rockheads, folks, while evolutionists will refrain from saying that the faces carved on Mount Rock, uh, Rushmore happens by chance, get this, folks, they really do believe that we all came from a rock. Don't believe me? Check out this video clip. Okay. Yeah. Asked me to speak at this college in Boston one time. This preacher called all the colleges and universities around Boston. I got my charts out and I said, now folks, I believe the Bible. <clears throat> Nobody cheered. I said, I believe about 6,000 years ago God made everything. The world's not millions of years old. And 2,000 years ago Jesus came and I gave him the basic Bible story, okay? Then I told them what they believe. Because most of them don't know what they believe, you have to tell them. <laughs> you guys believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down made a hard rocky crust, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive three billion years ago. And this early life form found somebody to marry. <laughs> Boy, now that's a good trick. And something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. One professor was getting kind of upset about this time. I seem to do that to them. He said, uh, Mr. Hoven, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world. I said, yes, sir, you're right about that. He said, you mean to tell me that you believe all these dogs came from two dogs off of Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? Ha, ha, ha. I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> I had one lady, I'm sorry, a woman, come to me after a debate one time. She was steaming down the aisle. Boy, she was mad. Oh, I could tell. I'm in trouble now. I stood there quivering in my boots, you know. She walked up and she said, tonight you said we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, well, ma'am, calm down just for a minute. I said, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, well, would you please tell me then where we came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, uh, where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> and you could see it was slowly dawning on her. I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? <laughs> yes, ma'am, you do. You ought to be proud of it. Hey, don't step on Grandpa, whatever you do. <laughs>
Stop and think about it. Use your own brain, folks. But not only that, at what stage of development can a person survive unless all your internal organs are all there on the scene, fully functioning at the same time? You can't exist if you haven't evolved a heart yet. You can't exist if you haven't evolved lungs yet. They've all got to be there, fully functioning at the same time. But that's not all. Scientists still don't understand how the eyeball fully works. The human eye completes 100,000 separate functions in a single day. It even conducts its own maintenance work while we sleep, but that's not all. The eye also has automatic aim, focus, and aperture adjustment. It even provides color in 3D images. It can automatically function from darkness to bright light instantly. Question, how did that evolve? That camera we're shooting this sermon with right now, folks, is extremely less complex than your eyeball. And are we going to say that Kyle got that because uh, a radio shack blew up and he found it in the midst of the ashes? Okay, then, but you're going to say that the eyeball is incredibly more complex, did? And again, just like the ears, we've got two of them? I don't think so, folks. Let's continue on. How about our brains? Did you know the brain is the most complex mechanism in all of the world? It just so happens to be the most influential organ of our bodies that enables us to think, remember, feel, reason, imagine, and analyze. It controls hearing, sight, smell, speech, eating, resting, learning, and everything else that makes us behave the way that we do. The average brain weighs about three pounds, yet it contains 12 billion cells, each of those cells connected to 10,000 other brain cells, making 120 trillion connections one guy says the connections in just one human brain is more than all the connections in all the appliances in the United States how many guys got your appliance from an explosion how many ever had them explode on you okay <laughs> hello that's our brain but that's still not all get this in fact the brain stores so much memory data that by the age of 40 folks it would take the entire state building full of computers just to store the same amount of information Yes, you can read. Yes, some of us less than others. But we're not going to go there because that could cause a church split. But anyway, that's right. How about our DNA, folks? Get this. We're almost done. Did you know the DNA molecule in our bodies is the most complex molecule in all of the universe? Its code is so unbelievably complex that if you typed it all out, it would create enough books to fill the Grand Canyon 40 times. Ken, Janet, are you here? I'm here somewhere. Okay, yeah, I saw you back there. You guys went to the Grand Canyon. That's a big hole, right? Can you imagine... Can't having to shovel that thing full of books 40 times? He'd still be there, wouldn't he? <laughs> Hello? Folks, that's just from the DNA code. Give me a break. In fact, folks, the average person in this room has 50 trillion cells in your body, each of those cells having 46 chromosomes. Times those two together, that's a massive amount of chromosomes, right? Get this, folks. That's, that's, that's nothing, nothing. When you take all the chromosomes, if you could, out of your body, they would only fill up two tablespoons. But that's still not the half of it, folks. That's not only highly complex, but what's even more amazing is if you could get your chromosomes out of your body, stretch them all out, and tie them all together. It must be a government job or something. You know, you get to do that kind of stuff, okay? But if you get all your chromosomes, uh, get them out of your body, somehow tie them all together, get this. One person's chromosomes would reach from the Earth and to the moon and back five million times. Not five times. Not five thousand times. Five million times. The scientific evidence, using your own brain this morning, it shows that folks, it not only was, but it had to be intelligently designed by an intelligent creator, right? Why? Because any intelligent person knows, once you see design in something, it implies what? A designer. And how many guys would say that that is God? I don't care what they say, they can call me a counterfeit or a snake. I may make the same mistakes, but I refuse to live another day the same. I'm walking away to a sunny place, but that doesn't mean it will never rain. Evidence and facts of all I have, I'm never brainwashing. But when the evidence is presented, they're never listening or watching. No wonder they learn nothing. Words get digested as far from the press and check the lesson in the message. I'm developing intelligence and moving on to better things, exposing your faulty notions with the potent evidence, exposing the lies of Darwin with the light of Christ. Man, I'm laughing at these guys that think my faith is blind. I ain't coin flipping, I'm investing. Investigating like a guy from CSI Studying a homicide, examining the murder victim Our reasons for breathing are different, my purpose is vivid it's evident that evidence suggests intelligence from severing connections Empirical evidence plus forensics I'm presenting The evidence is far from compelling It's overwhelming that life was designed for higher intelligence I'm remembering, dissecting these messages Digesting what's relevant Evolution is heroin, stop injecting I'm trying to stop your flesh from melting Is it evidence, evaluation or indoctrination? 
contemplate my information as I make these statements Intelligent design testifies to creation Indoctrination or evidence evaluation There's no escaping that DNA was created The human brain's amazing Far from an accident the evidence is lacking Charles Nothing but assumptions Irreducible complexity suggests a function And we both know something never comes from nothing Cause he declares the end from the beginning Prophecies intended for atheists who deny his creation Within his blueprints is the evidence of his excellence but atheists refuse to do some investigating It's understandable that animals are capable of changing But there's limits to that variation I never asked for arguments, I wanted conversations it's evident that evidence suggests intelligence I'm severing connections, empirical evidence Plus forensics I'm presenting The evidence is far from compelling It's overwhelming that life is designed by higher intelligence I'm remembering, dissecting these messages Ingesting what's relevant Evolution is heroin, stop injecting I'm trying to stop your flesh from melting There's evidence evaluation or indoctrination Fact is a theory that has no evidence Atheists deny intelligent design I wonder why they live their lives on YouTube Say the Bible's nothing but lies I'm surprised a person's pride can be so high Try show them evidence and they just close their eyes Ignore the science and continue to run from God who gave them life You say I'm crazy cause I don't believe in evolution Claim monkeys evolved into humans but it ain't been proven The Big Bang didn't happen, that's another lie The missing link is still missing, you will never find An animal in transition switching to another kind Christians been convinced by evidence You've been brainwashed by the lies they bark, there's no purpose to life But their heart bears witness to creation And their conscience tells them wrong from right You're running out of time to so give your life to Christ It's evident that evidence suggests intelligence And severing connections, empirical evidence Plus forensics I'm presenting The evidence is far from compelling It's overwhelming that life is designed by higher intelligence I'm remembering, dissecting these messages Ingesting what's relevant Evolution is heroin, stop injecting I'm trying to stop the flesh from melting Is it evidence of evaluation or indoctrination? It's evident that evidence suggests intelligence and severing connections Empirical evidence plus forensics I'm presenting The evidence is far from depressing It's overwhelming that life is designed with higher intelligence I'm remembering, dissecting these messages Ingesting what's relevant Evolution is heroin, stop injecting I'm trying to stop the flesh from melting Is it evidence evaluation or indoctrination? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men Who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed for ever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them.